thank you. Appreciate that. I'm glad I'm being here. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So anyway, I mean, if you think about how water flows, water flows, you have the hydraulic conductivity, how much water, you know, you've got this quantity, and then you have your hydraulic gradient from a high potential to a low potential. If you got a big difference, it's going to make that flow be larger. If you have a small difference, it's going to be smaller. It's similar to electricity. Voltage times divided by resistivity, which is resistivity is the um, inverse of conductivity. And so it's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same kind of relationship. You've got a gradient and you have how, how fast that material moves through it. Okay. And so the unit that we use when we're talking about heat flow is our geothermal gradient degrees, um, I'm sorry, is our heat flow, milliwatts per meter square. Watts, they're just like watts is a measure of energy. You deal with watts every day when you deal with your electricity bill. Yeah, we know what watts are. Okay, convective heat transfer. Ever notice fractures in rocks? They're all over the place. There. So we study um, permeabilities of rocks, so inside of rocks, the holes in rocks as they move through. So all of that permeability, you throw a fracture in a rock, that becomes the primary, you can, can become the primary conduit through which fluids move. Okay, in the earth, you get hot water, heated up, less dense, it's going to come through the cracks and you can get convection, moving heat around in the Earth's crust. Think about this for a second. Um, actually, you know, anytime you get up to a, a fracture, and you'll notice this if you go to field camp, you see fractures in rocks, you're going to see alteration in rocks. That alteration is from fluids moving through the rock, and probably because of buoyancy driven processes. That's it. Thanks. Um, ore deposits happen in fractures in rocks. Ore deposits are fossil geothermal systems. So they can be a really good way of studying ancient geothermal systems and the way they developed. So this is Dave Blackwell, geothermal lab at SMU. He studied thermal conductivity, he went out, took all of the holes he could get his hands on um, for, um, to determine the geothermal gradient. And he calculated, and he developed this geothermal um, map of North America. Now other people have done similar maps um, using, I mean, similar, the same data, in this case, he was um, actually incorporating data from oil and gas wells, uh, which was tricky because there are certain differences. Um, when, you, when you develop an oil and gas well, um, the temperatures in that well are disturbed when, you're, when you actually drill a hole. So to get the actual thermal, con or to get the geothermal gradient can be challenging. Uh, but he worked it. He worked it with those numbers uh, to come up with a comprehensive map of where he thinks the the heat flow is. Sometimes, if you look at some of these um, values, you see it's kind of pockmarked. Sometimes that's because of individual wells that may have. And so it may not. It's hard to know how well this. Uh, it shows some general trends. Okay. Um, just a couple of things I want you to note here. The Western United States is definitely hotter uh, than the Eastern, and we have some other interesting places in here. And, you know, geothermal gradient, as you go down, um, these are some of the maps he designed or he developed. And again, they give you an idea at depth what kinds of temperatures you get. And in some places, it's hotter than others. So now I want to look at 
geothermal resources and how we develop them. There are two ways when you're thinking about geothermal resources. You want to think about energy production and direct use. Okay. So energy production, producing electricity. Okay. Four different kinds of technologies that I'm going to discuss, and then four major ones. Um, Steam-based turbine-driven systems, flash steam, enhanced geothermal systems. This is a new field, um, definitely being investigated with a lot of potential, and binary systems. So one of the things I talked about was in geothermal, you're looking at the ways that you develop geothermal is you look at how fluids move through rocks. That's how you, the energy from rocks is extracted into a form that you can actually use it. Maybe there are places where you can actually use the hot rock to do something, but to find it in some usable form, usually you need water to actually take that heat and bring it to you in a way that you can actually use it. Um, the most efficient type of geothermal system you can get is if steam comes out of the earth. If you get a place where you can actually capture steam coming out of the earth, run it up, you run a turbine, that turbine is, is attached to a generator and you can throw your energy off to um, the electrical grid and very useful. The other method um, that probably most of the traditional geothermal plants uses a flash steam method. So you have hot water coming out of the well, goes into a separator tank, and into that separator tank, it separates between water and steam. You send that steam off, run your generator, and so you have a flash steam um, uh, system. Now, Again, we were talking about water in these systems. Water is how you transfer things. You got a lot of hot rock out there that's impermeable. Okay. How do we get that heat out? Well, we now have all these wonderful technologies for knowing how to bust up rocks, things like fracking, right? Guess what? These are called enhanced geothermal systems. So what you're doing here, what enhanced geothermal systems, the promise of them is that if you can go down into the ground, you can bust up some rock, you can, you can build a geothermal system around them. So what you're doing here is you get some busted up rock, you get the hot water out, you run it through some kind of turbine system, you cool the water, put it back down there, and you can create a system. Um, I'm going to say, I'm just going to say in my little head what I think. I think these carry promise, they may work. The one thing that I sort of look at is yes, you can bust up a rock, but if you just have like one major fraction there that you open up, you can circumvent this. Um, or you can circumvent this circular system and lose all your hot water to some other place in the system. So that's my, my drawback on um, developing these systems. But people are investigating it, and I really hope I'm wrong, because I think there's a lot of potential for this, for this system. Um, one, there is a uh, pilot project from the um, Department of Energy, the Forge project in um, Utah. If you want to look at a video about the Forge project, this is here. Um, I will provide a PDF with my um, slides for this lecture to you that you can then use to, you know, if you want to look at all of my links. Um, and they're just a smattering of links. You know. um, but um, Actually, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, there was a woman uh, who gave a, a talk on 
different kinds of seismicity that she was working, human interactions with seismic data in Utah. She was working on this Utah Forge project. One of the things that's also really um, difficult with these enhanced geothermal systems, but what's one of the hazards of fracking? Earthquakes. Lots of little micro earthquakes associated with this. And certainly if you're trying to build up a major fracture network, that could be an issue. Um, but people are working at it. And, and I think, I also think as we really are understanding more of this process, we're gonna get better ways of monitoring it. Lots of good, interesting um, geophysical methods of doing it. Now, binary systems. These are the most common type being installed today. Okay, to run a flash steam system or a, a steam system, you need 150 C water. Flash steam, 180 C. But what if you can take the hot water, warm water, let's just call it warm water, coming out of the ground, and you can go into some kind, so you bring out warm water, and you have this closed loop system, and you have some heat transfer to some other liquid that has a lower flash point. The different kinds of organic uh, materials have lower flash points. You know, you've seen that. Nice organic stuff, you can smell it, it vaporizes much earlier than, you know. Okay, so what you do is that you run your turbine with this lower temperature, lower flash point material. Um, and these are being installed. There are sometimes some very large installations looking at, I mean, I'll call it warm rock that do this. Now, the real issue with these systems is you have to run a whole lot of water through your systems, They're very large. And again, I'm a little concerned when you install these kinds of systems, um, just the basics of, of putting the infrastructure in there, you're gonna have to, you, the engineers don't necessarily think about this, but as you build things in it, you develop fractures in the rock. And so you can build fractures in the rock. Some of those fractures are gonna let more hot water come in, but it can also take hot water away from your system. And so these, this is, again, these, these are some really good ideas and people are investigating them. I just, you know, in my, my brain, those, that's where my brain goes when I think about these systems. Um, but I really look forward to being wrong. Install geothermal energy. Definitely increase it over time. Definitely becoming more and more, um, well, okay, you can see it. I don't need to, I don't need to go there. Okay, direct use, hot water, hot springs. I don't even just set in the hot springs. Nice. It's the oldest and most versatile form of use, using geothermal energy. Ground source heat pumps. Basically, you're taking groundwater, you're moving it through the, you know, up to somewhere where you actually use it, and then you inject it for cold, cold water. That's the uh, basics of ground source heat pumps, but all of these other uses, all of these other uses of heat. People have used these for millennia. Nice stuff. Nice thing about a heat pump. So uh, in the winter, you can take that hot water from the ground, use that, circulate it in your house, or use it as a way of circulating the house and take the cold water back down. In the summer, you can take the hot air from your house, turn it into water, push it down, and bring up cold water. Now these systems, these heat pumps, take energy. So you have to do that intricate balance between 
how much energy are you using to pump this system to how much you're actually getting from it. But, uh, but it's definitely an interesting thing. Um, I did want to mention one other thing, like with um, direct use, I went to Iceland. Iceland has lots of volcanic, nice hot rocks. They heat all of their homes using direct use heat. They have these huge piping systems around, you see them, and they just, it's direct use. 90% of all heating comes from direct use of geothermal. They also have power plants, okay? So the direct use, you're actually using it, power plants, you're generating electricity. And you probably have experience, electricity is a whole lot more versatile than just heat. But the other thing about, you know, all of these technologies, about the binary technologies and some of the direct use heat is, yeah, I mean, we talk about this is the hottest part of the world uh, in the United States. This is probably where, you, you know, you could really start thinking about electricity production on a big, massive scale. But throughout the country, what, it gets hotter as you go down in the earth. You can use these resources anywhere if you can make them economic. Uh, if you can make them economic. Those are, those are some challenges, and we talked a little bit about those. How much energy? So at this point, we're at about um, 15,000 megawatts, and that little E means electricity. So that's what we generate in terms of electricity. Um, it, 15,000 megawatts. A megawatt is going to um, supply maybe a thousand people. Okay. So 15,000 times a thousand, that's a million, 15 million people get their electricity. That's enough. Okay. Um, Geothermal Energy Association says we've only developed maybe 6.9% of, of what we really know about in terms of really hot water that's out there. So there's a lot more out there. Um, IPCC, uh, much, much higher. And then there is the MIT report. They were using, they were definitely investigating um, the use of enhanced geothermal systems and these binary systems. Um, but they estimated the potential of 100 gigawatt hours. So, you know, see a good seven or eight times that much um, if we invested in EGS. Um, in terms of, uh, I have some notes there at the bottom, but I can't see my notes. I took notes for myself, but I can't see those. Um, in terms of global energy production, um, I'm not, I don't have some good numbers here, but it definitely starts to work into your five, 10% of global energy production at that point. Um, I don't think geothermal will, will ever solve all of our energy problems, but if you can take care of five or 10%, um, you're doing really well. And it's also gonna be better in some areas than not for some purposes rather than others. But let's look at this direct use. I actually looked at this number last night and said, what? I always thought of direct use as like a, a little side use. This is 107 megawatt, and that little T means thermal. Okay, so direct use is a way of thinking about that. Compare those two numbers. So by far, direct use is the major use of geothermal, and it's used everywhere. You don't even you don't have to have sophisticated technology. It's being used in a lot. And again, so we have lots of heat. I think I messed up. Uh, okay. Anyway, my next place, my next part is to look at geothermal places of interest. Let me see what's that. First one I want to look at is Geysers, California. Then I'm going to look at the Salton Sea. Then I'm going to look at Dixie Valley, which is where I did my um, modeling work for geothermal. Okay, I want you to, before we look at 
geysers. I want you to just think, what do you know about that tectonic setting? What's going on there? We've got the San Andreas Fault right in here. Yeah. I wonder what do we have right there it is. What do we have right there? What is it right there? What what does what little thing sits right there? So yeah, Wanda Fuca. I like Wanda. Wanda Fuca. But so you've got the Wanda Fuca and you've got um, the San Andreas Fault there. Um, so the geyser geothermal is the largest geothermal in the world. It has a, a 1,500 megawatt installed capacity. Um, that's its installed capacity. I've also seen that it only is generating 900 um, megawatts. Nonetheless, it's a major source of energy for the San Francisco Bay area. It is the largest in the world. Um, and it's not just one power plant. There's multiple power plants. It is a dry steam production. Okay. So it's an interesting geologic area. So here we go. There's the Mendocino fracture zone. There's uh, the walk. This is an old diagram, but it's just the Juan de Fuca. And this is the San Andreas. So basically, about 3 million years ago, um, this was a subduction zone, but then the San Andreas Fault kind of started moving in this direction. So that are, I'm not describing the geology well, but nonetheless, you've got the San Andreas Fault uh, that is now moving that um, wonderful plate to the north. Um, and what you have is, and, and, and but you still have magma there. And so you still have, there's a magma zone, uh, probably about six kilometers down um, in this area. Um, clear Lake, basically, you, you get a lot of volcanics in this region. You have this, this zone here. And then you have an interesting situation where there's a nice permeable rock that any water that gets down there interacts with this magma or super hot rock around that magma turns to very hot water or can water sea is very it's hot and then there's a nice cap rock so you've got this this unit down there with lots and lots of steam and we had there were you know these nice little geothermal areas that actually got to be developed as a as a resort people used to go there because it was you know 100 150 years ago nice hot water to go play in um but it represents a huge amount of steam and this is it's a unique situation because of that nice cap rock and that nice reservoir rock. And um, so it's been developed as a geothermal resource, a stream steam production. Nice, interesting one. Um, one of the interesting things about it is they developed all of the steam from it. It was great energy, but they took too much steam out of it. And so they needed to get water back into it. So they now use they pump and and so like late 1990s, it fell apart. The, the production fell off because they had uh, taken all the water out of it. And one of the things about the, the water system there is it's under pressured. It doesn't follow the hydraulic gradient. It's under pressured because it's so hot and it is full of steam blows it away. What they have to do is take wastewater from Santa Rosa, pump it in, and they now pump in sewage, not sewage, well, wastewater into this system, deep into the earth, and nothing's gonna happen to it, it's bad. Uh, it's gonna get nice and cooked out, <laughs> but turn it into, uh, they're replenishing that, and now they've been able to get that working again. So that's that's the geysers, um, definitely an interesting, but now let's move on to the fun stuff, <laughs> the Salton Sea. So the Salton Sea, um, First of all, this is a little side topic. How did the salt and sea form? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> okay, here we go. And this is a hydrology question. You've got the Colorado River coming down here. This is the Colorado River, and it flows out here. I'm not sure I can see there. I think that's the general. 
They used to divert the Colorado, well, they diverted the Colorado River for irrigation here. About 100 years ago, there was a breach of that diversion system and it filled up this depression. This um, Salton Sea is um, below sea level. If you, I don't know if you can see down here, but the elevation, uh, anyway, the elevation down there is about 200 uh, feet below sea level. It's like, it's like Death Valley, okay? So it all filled up, filled up with water. It became really, people, people fell in love with it. They thought it was a great tourist destination, okay? But if you know anything about the Colorado River, we're even like, you know, too much of the water. And now San Diego is taking a lot of water. And so there's not as much water coming into the Salton Sea. So, anyway, okay, in the Salton Sea, in this region, um, 10 power plants, 300 more in Naples. Okay, so I got, I got, I'm sorry, I got on this tangent about water. What I want you to recognize, do you see here? Here are our plate boundaries. What's going on tectonically here? Got the San Andreas here, but you have a little bit of a, you can start seeing where this divergent plate boundaries are starting to pull that crust away. What happens at divergent plate boundaries? Creating new crust, partial melting of the mantle, and water interacting with that. This, this is probably one of those really monster big resources. Okay. So, um, again, 10 per power plants and 300 plus of megawatts of energy. And because the Salton Sea is rising up, this is from 2001, this is 2010, this is 2020. Look at what's happening right along here over time. You're definitely seeing the salt and sea dry up. So you have a whole much, much more area that you could start exploring for geothermal energy. And that's happening. So it's a, it's a really, okay, it's a hot area. Now, okay, so you've got this magma, you've got this water. And that water, it, when it comes up, is it water? Brine. It is super brine. It is 10 times saltier than seawater. Okay. Interacting. It contains the periodic table of elements. It contains everything. Okay. Um, and one of the challenges of developing the geothermal resources in this area is those waters are extremely caustic. Okay. That kind of brine. <laughs> especially when it's hot. <laughs> and then when it cools down, it precipitates all kinds of minerals. So you think about your plumbing system that you use in these geothermal plants. Okay, if you wanna do chemistry, there you got some really, really fun chemistry problems. They're really seriously fun chemistry problems. Um, yeah, there's some seriously fun, and engineering chemistry. Because um, some people have done some really cool. Um, John Featherstone, if you want resources on some of the work he's done, um, has done some amazing like engineering things to try to deal with all of the uh, precipitation dissolution of minerals from this. Just amazing stuff. But we've got the periodic table of elements. You have a whole bunch of stuff. What do we need right now in our energy mix? We need lithium. We need lithium for batteries. Okay, so we're extracting, we're working at extracting lithium from those bronze. So here, you've got a um, production well, you flash it, you take that material here, um, periodic table, and if you can find a way of getting that lithium out of it, um, lithium extract, I'm sorry, that, 
that's your injection water. You can get your lithium out of it to develop. And it, that looks very probable. I worked for a little while on a geothermal plant there in the Salton Sea, and they referred to it as a chemical plant that produces heat. So that's, that's okay, Sorry. it's fun stuff. Now on to my baby, Dixie Valley. Okay, so one of the things is, you know, this system here, you've got volcanic rocks. This system here, you have volcanic rocks. You've got volcanic rocks here, but you really don't have much active volcanism except in this region. So no active volcanism. Can't get our heat from there. This particular, if you remember from the heat flow map, this area is hot. Okay? It's hot. It's hot. It's really cool. <laughs> it's hot. You said it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we should, we should, we have, we have to have like the list of really bad geology puns. Yes. Yeah. See, I started out school as a music major and I ended up in hard rock. <laughs> okay, that's called a bad pun. But Dixie Valley. Okay, so what's happened is people have gone and, and they, they drill holes for various reasons in this region. And whoops, they run into hot water. Like it's really hot. And it's like, what? And they, but they found there's numerous hot springs all through this region. First, can anybody tell me tectonically what's going on here? Somebody who hasn't said yet anything yet. Not you either. Okay. <laughs> what's the Earth's crust doing there? Pulling apart. Okay, so pulling apart, what kind of faulting do you think you have? It's called the basin range per foot. What? Who said? What? What, what kinds of faulting? Normal. normal faults. So you got lots of normal faults, lots of faulting in here. And uh, what you and and the, that faulting is probably going deep into the crust. Um, but what's happening? here is that there's numerous hot springs. That's great. But we found like 75% of the really hot rocks in the hot water systems here, we found by accident. Which gives you an idea that there's all sorts of hot springs, hot rocks, all the way through these, there aren't hot springs, but hot water right beneath the surface that we haven't found. Okay. So the place I looked at was Dixie Valley, it's right there. And I don't know how well I can show this, but here are the wells. If I was to plot out the actual geothermal gradient, what the average geothermal gradient in this area it should be about like that. And these are all of these different wells here. In this case, you can see a well that's almost like 100 degrees higher. Okay, heating a rock that, I mean, I think when I, I, when I calculated out the amount of energy that had been added to that rock through what we call advective processes, which is sort of, it's sort of conductive plus um, conductive convective, we call it advective, but that process, that would have been over the last 100,000 years, the amount of energy en entered to this little part of the world would be enough to supply the energy to the world for a year. Okay, major amount of energy into that little region. And so my dissertation project was to try to figure out how all of this rock got heated up. Also, there was a temperature in this region that was um, 300, uh, 285 degrees C at three kilometers depth in this bowl right here, um, way above the geothermal gradient. Um, so extremely hot rock. And so I built a model and I said, well, this is what I call, sometimes I call it my toy model. Anybody who's done geology 
realizes that things are a lot more complex than this. But I assumed that you had a fracture zone that went down to depth uh, along that. One thing I didn't quite make it clear, let me go back. One of the things when you're looking at this and you look through the faulted zones here, right through here, as that rock lubus, there's lots of there's lots of fractures in there, and you've got some normal movement, some side to side movement. So you have some areas where little pockets where rock is being pulled apart, and they're being pulled apart in sort of a, a constrained region, and that's going to extend down to depth. And we have earthquake data saying that earthquakes have gone down to 12 kilometers deep there, which suggests that fluids are flowing that deep in the crust. And so I did a heat, um, I did a computer model, this is how I built my model, but I did a computer model looking at how the heat um, and fluids would have moved through this system to create this. And this is what, if you watch this, what you'll start seeing is, I'm at about 1500, it's really when you start to see things. But you start to see within this conduit, you get convection. And this was really kind of surprising. This is something people really haven't thought about. But you get that convection, and as it brings heat up, it starts to spread laterally. Now, there's, very, there's differences um, between these models, and basically the differences are, different, are based on different kinds of thermal conductivities and permeabilities of the rocks. Uh, that seem to make sense to me. And as you move there, you'll see over, uh, let me get to 100,000 years, how this large resource develops. And so basically, at about 100,000 years, and we have other evidence to suggest that this geothermal system is at least 100,000 years, you start to see how the rock. What I basically was able to do in my dissertation was to show how a volume of rock that large could get heated up. I didn't have to work that hard at it either. It, it, um, once, I, once I sort of stumbled upon this mechanism, it explains an awful lot of how the heat evolves in the system. So that was my PhD dissertation, and it is my um, Anyway. Okay, okay. So I am going to quickly uh, move on. Let me see if I can. Okay. So the fin final thing I wanted to talk about, and I am sorry, I have gone over my time. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. Um, we have lots of oil and gas wells in Texas lots of hot water. Um, I won't go into detail on it, but they're working at trying to produce uh, geothermal heat from oil and gas wells. So you can either do, there's various ways you can do this. I won't go into details on it, but it's definitely being used. Um, in many cases, uh, these can't be standalone geothermal systems. You use them in conjunction with your oil and gas. You use it sometimes for an individual process. Um, lots and lots of wells, abandoned wells, various ways of doing this. Um, and here's just some of the considerations. Uh, there's a, geothermal has a lot of potential, but there are a lot of challenges to developing it. Um, nonetheless, we're working through it. And um, I think that there's a lot of promise for the future. If you want more information about geothermal, come talk to me um, and I will make my slides available. And I'm sorry about going um, over time. Um, I just got a little too enthusiastic. Anyway, thank you for your attention. Um, oh, I also wanted to just thank Maria Richards. She's been a great friend and all of the other characters. Any questions? Actually, why don't we deal with questions afterwards? Okay.
if you do have any questions, then we will definitely be able to contact Dr. Holding. We'll give you your information. And like she said, the slides will be made available for everybody. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, as you see, we actually just got in some Kia Pub t shirts. We're going to be selling them. So, we got a couple different price ranges. So, if y'all volunteer with us, y'all get a free shirt. Like, that's just kind of how it is. Um, we do have a couple of events coming up. If y'all are actually wanting a free shirt, so uh, we'll mention those later in the PowerPoint. For our students, so pretty much everyone here, grad and undergrad, we're doing uh, $5. Um, for geoscience faculty, we're doing 10, and then everyone outside of that that hasn't been mentioned already is about 15. So we will be selling those after the meeting today. This will work. So uh, as you all know, this is our last meeting of the this year. And um, so it's, it's been a wonderful ride uh, with, with the whole team and you know having you all here every time and your support uh, so uh, in total like uh, since uh, we use presence before to for our sign up but uh, SOCA changing it up but uh, until it, uh, so when it went down we had like 50 plus members uh, uh, currently in Geo club we did 12 total uh, speakers who joined us virtual and in person in our bi-weekly meetings and we did uh, mineral sales, lots of events and trips. Uh, we also uh, gave our members uh, DGS and GSA memberships. And uh, uh, we offered a member and officer scholarships from uh, our funds. And uh, for club promotion, uh, I think um, we have the bulletin board at the SU. I think um, our previous clubs didn't have this bulletin board before. But yeah, we are uh, we designed it and everything is is, is in the SU. You, uh, you guys can go and see. Um, and um, we opened uh, Geo Club Discord, digital signage. We uh, promoted our uh, activities on social media. We made new brochures and posters. We made our T-shirts, and uh, with uh, the new logo and monogram, we made business uh, cards. Rock Talk, we did Rock Talk interviews, and also. Uh, resume workshop, but we'll get into the more details of the sales and uh, other events and uh, after this. So sad. Yeah. Okay, there's also more activities we have done, which includes the Kid Love Collection pickup from Houston, multiple mm -hmm. uh, span events, which is like that home with the lots of minerals. Uh, we've also, as we said before, we covered uh, expenses for DPS field trip, uh, the hydrogeo workshop, we promoted scholarships and internships, increased enrollment in GEOS classes, raised awareness in the GEOS community. We've made connections with uh, SMU, EcoHub, JSON Energy Club, SOC, and Perot Museum. Uh, and more. Uh, we've, hold, we've held a Halloween party. We've taken a trip to Arkansas, so Ron Coleman Mine. We've done a planetarium visit, Perot Museum. We've done the hydrology workshop in uh, Turner Falls. We've gone to Richland High School for a career fair, Arlington Genomic Mineral Show. We've increased sales by weekly mineral sales. And uh, we've done sales at SU Green. We've done a Valentine's Day sale, blowout sales, Fossil Mania and Waco, which is coming up. Um, we've done a lot. Okay, so Maine, if you are interested in going to Maine, we have a conference that's happening from June 19th to June 14th is when we come back. Uh, if you're interested, scan this QR code. Um, it's carbon related, all things carbon, super interesting. If you can make it, fill out that QR code for your chance to win a free trip to Maine. Really cool. All expense covered. A uh, new Geo Club officer is my people. We got Chelsea is president. We got, I don't know who that is, is president of the spring. <laughs> Stacia Tacker is vice president. Carson is treasurer. Jarrett as mineral star. 
Manda Marcela as a uh, secretary and webmaster is Mia Rudin. So congratulations to everyone. <laughs> Well, as usual, this is the part where I talk about free money and free jobs. So, free jobs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so for internship, I want to bring the attention to the first one because that ties into using LinkedIn. So we got this information about this internship from a former UTD student, an alumni, who reached out to us on LinkedIn and wants his fellow comments to come and work in the company because he knows comments are really hardworking and amazing geoscience students. So why I bring this up is that if you don't have a LinkedIn, he may not be able to check for you or help refer you. So I encourage you, if you haven't, please make your LinkedIn, put all the stuff you've done. If you volunteer at Wakershire, if you come for mineral sales, if you come for these meetings, that should be on your LinkedIn. So we have the Weaver Consultants Group, we have the TRC Environmental Intern, and then the Geology Lab Internship at Colm College. Again, all these links will be in the group me on Discord, and I encourage you to apply. If you need any help with your resumes, if you need help with like setting up your LinkedIn, or if you want like advice about such stuff, you can come to any of the offices and wait to help you or give you resources that can help you with that. We do also have the recording from the resume workshop Absolutely. meeting uh, that is on YouTube as well under Geoscience Studios. So that's a lot of tips and tricks on resumes. So if you're needing tips and tricks, probably watch that before coming to us because I'm probably going to tell you the exact same thing mm -hmm. since I presented it. Probably. Like, so yeah. We have the Waco trip coming up on April 30th and May 1st. We still have a few spots that are available. So if you're interested, I need to know by either the end of today or the end of the weekend so I can get the forms out to everyone and send them off to SOC. It's gonna be a pretty fun trip. We're going to be going up Saturday morning, setting up, doing the sales, and afterwards going to get some dinner and then just basically hang out for the rest of the night, do the same thing Sunday, and then head back home after the trip. So. Really, it's a pretty fun thing to do. Like they said, you get a free t-shirt out of it. And also, uh, yeah, help the club make some money and have a pretty good time at the same time. And we'll give you time to go and like look around at the Waco show too. We're not just gonna hold you captive, I promise. Yeah. We're doing stuff in shifts. So. I also wanted to bring up, I, I imagine all of y'all have heard about this and posted very much around in your emails, but the end of semester party is coming up. Uh, so it's on April 29th as well. Um, it's Korean food. I believe it's in this room. Yep. Um, and so come get free food for broke students. We like free food. And also we got Rock Talk with Caitlin and Amanda. Do you know anything about this week's show? Uh, this week's show uh, was yesterday. We did geology with the workers. Like next week is going to be the programming ends for the MTV on the first. So next week's going to be final. Overview. Hopefully, maybe we'll just upload highlights from previous shows. I mean, then you could speed run it. We could. Oh, okay. <laughs> just increase the speed that it was the time. Oh, jeez. All right, and as you all know, we have our social medias, uh, join the Discord, we do a lot of announcements there. Uh, group me also is usually just for announcements now. Um, we have our Instagram, Facebook, Facebook's always good for alumni and TikTok just for fun, because I like making geology jokes, it's a lot more fun that way. And I cry less. <laughs> and we also have the Geoscience Student Discord, I imagine all of y'all know about it. There's a section for grads and a section for undergrads. Um, so that's kind of a little bit more like class based. All right, and we got a mineral t shirt door prize. So if y'all haven't signed in, please go ahead and sign in. And going a little bit bigger with the mineral door prize this time, it is a rhodochrosite quartz and chocolate pyrite from Santa Rita, Peru. And it is a very, very nice specimen if any of you want to see it. But yeah, make sure you signed in so you can have a chance. Thank you. 
So if you were in my environmental geology online class, um, I'd like to meet you. Um, I'd like to get to know you. So please come up to me, get some pizza, and we'll spend a little bit of time um, talking. I think we'll go down to my office after this. So um, after they give away the rocks. We're at 14. Henry. Henry. And we'll get your shirt size and your shirt after the meeting as well. All right, so everyone, we actually did a little bit Something a little bit special at the end of the meeting. Uh, we decided to get and so like what torches. We to get some, yeah. <laughs> we decided to get torches for y'all. So and cupcakes. There's like a bunch of cupcakes out there from nothing but cakes. So y'all are welcome to go and now eat and whatever y'all like. Thank y'all for coming. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Cash card. Yeah, I'll make it out for myself. Hey guys, we're gonna be selling shirts in here if you're interested. Bye everyone. So well.